Well, when we left off at our last session together, we were talking about the Second Great Awakening and the aftermath coming out of the Second Great Awakening. Uh, one of the things that we saw in the Second Great Awakening was this so-called new measures, these innovative measures that Charles Grandison Finney took to, to heighten this revival fervor and to heighten the revival response. We were talking briefly about that quote from Nathan Hatch, the American church historian, uh, his book, The Democratization of American Christianity. I just wanna go back and pick up a theme because I think it's very important. I think it helps us understand a sort of impulse of American Christianity that occurred during this era. You know, one of the things we've been saying all along is that Christianity in America is either a question of cultural accommodation or confessional affirmation. Well, the driving force in American culture from the 1800s to the 1840s was two primary elements. Uh, number one was the frontier. Uh, we had settled the eastern seaboard, but we were moving west. Uh, this is hard for us to wrap our heads around, uh, but there was a time when Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania was the far outreaches of the western frontier of these United States. And we quickly pushed past that into the Midwest and then Lewis and Clark opening the West for us, et cetera. But this was the time of the frontier. It was also a time of what historians refer to as Jacksonian democracy. And this came to a head in the presidential election between John Quincy Adams. This is John Adams' son. And so there you have that representation of old colonial New England, of the Eastern seaboard, and then against John Quincy Adams is Andrew Jackson, the populist, uh, the, the one who was able to hold a crowd, right? And of course he's victorious and so, historians, those who observe American culture, speak of this as the era of Jacksonian democracy. So the impact on that, both the frontier and Jacksonian democracy, was on a new religious populism in American Christianity. Now, what does that mean and how do we unpack that? Well, the old denominations that dominated the seaboard, the Presbyterians, the Congregationalists, the Anglicans, well, the Anglicans had an extra burden to bear uh, coming off of the Revolutionary War, so that made it difficult for the Anglicans. But those, those sort of staid, established denominations were in a constant decline every single decade of the 1800s. The two new kids on the block were in constant growth mode. One was Methodism which came to America in the 1790s, and it spread like wildfire across the frontier, and the other were the Baptists. And they too spread against the frontier and across the frontier. And one of the things that you begin to see among these new movements and among these new uh, religious identities on the frontier is that many of these ministers were untrained. Uh, many of them were just lay taught. Uh, versus the East Coast ministers that went to college and, and had their seminary training and knew their Latin and, and knew their Greek and knew their Hebrew. And so you have trained clergy versus an untrained clergy. Uh, we've talked many times about that confessionalism and those confessional standards that were part of these denominations on the seaboard, the Presbyterians with their Westminster Standards, the Anglicans with their 39 Articles, the Congregationalists with their, their Cambridge Platform, and even many of the Baptists along the coast either adhered to the London Confession of Faith or a slight modification of that, the Philadelphia Confession of Faith. Of course, from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia itself. But out on the frontier, a lot of those were jettisoned. And they were jettisoned for what we were calling Biblicism, that Bible only. So you're beginning to see how this new movement that's emerging in this sort of new brand of American Christianity that's emerging out on the frontier is looking very different uh, from the previous three, four, five generations of Christianity that were populating the seaboard 
and the Atlantic coast. As we come out of this era and this new era of religious populism, America begins a quick ascent into modernism as we finish off the 1800s. And this brings us into one of the most significant theological developments, and we need to spend some time on this, and that's what we're going to do this episode. And that significant development is liberalism. Liberalism was on the rise from post-Civil War, so 1850s, 60s, right until 1900. And where it really flowers is in the 1900s, and the 1910s. And contrary to liberalism is going to be fundamentalism. But you're going to have to stay tuned because we're going to get to that in the next two episodes. See, I want you to keep coming back. But right now, let's talk about liberalism. A big picture of liberalism is this. Liberalism is Christianity's accommodation to modernism. We've been seeing this Remember, I mentioned to you that deism was Christianity's accommodation to the Enlightenment. This religious popularism and this sort of biblicism and this anti-confessionalism, anti-creedalism that is just part of the American psyche, that sort of pro-enthusiastic, exuberant, expressive revivalism that is part of the American psyche, American Christian psyche, that's all part of this accommodation to frontier culture, to Jacksonian democracy. And here we see another cultural accommodation that liberalism is a cultural accommodation to modernism. Once again, the church is trying to have its cake and eat it too. It wants to hold on to some semblance of a Christian identity. Meanwhile, be acceptable culturally. It is a fool's errand. But we need to see it, and we need to see how it unfolds. It unfolds over these decades, and we can identify any number of things that contributed to it. I've identified six. So I want to walk you through these six. The first one is that the enthusiasm, that sort of exuberance and extreme, almost emotional extreme behavior that came out of the Second Great Awakening, Here's that old pendulum swing again. As that, as that pendulum swings wide to enthusiasm, what's going to happen? You're going to find a reaction swinging wide in the other direction. And so you're going to find this embrace of rationalism and wanting to understand Christianity as a rationalist enterprise, not as just mere emotive expression. So during this period of the 1860s, you're going to see a number of educational institutions, a number of denominations, a number of Christian leaders literally wanting to distance themselves from those excesses of the Second Great Awakening and stand instead for an overly excessive rationality, bordering on a rationalism. And now that's going to admit all kinds of ideas of how we think about God, of how we think about Scripture, how we think about Jesus, how we think about ourselves. So we see an overreaction to the excesses of the Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening. The second thing we see, and this comes out of the Second Great Awakening too, there was a great deal of social activism. And this is the time of the temperance societies. Uh, This is the time of women's suffrage. Uh, This is a time of a growing urban culture that also has along with it a growing manufacturing base that also has along with it, very sadly, child labor. And so you have all these social ills that come about with these urban sort of ghettos that start developing and the impact that has on poverty and so forth. And so you're going to have a great deal of social activism. And if you go back to the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s, the other piece that's huge in social activism here, of course, is the anti-slavery movement. So as this is coming out of the Second Great Awakening, there is a great emphasis on social activism. Well, sometimes you have the gospel, 
and you preach the gospel, and then as a result of the gospel preached, you get engaged and, and you want to address social issues and you want to reach out from that. And as the next generation comes along, sadly, they sometimes simply forget the gospel. And instead of having the gospel and the results of the gospel being paying attention to these things, we just skip over the gospel part and go right to fixing the issues and fixing the problems. And so as we move from the 1850s to the 1900s, we see the rise of what's called the social gospel. Now, this doesn't come to full flower until the 19 zeros. One of the major figures here is a German Baptist theologian with a very German name, Walter Rauschenbusch. And so Walter Rauschenbusch is sometimes considered the founder of the social gospel. And what he does is he totally transforms the concept of the kingdom. He totally transforms the concept of salvation. Salvation is not about deliverance from sin. Salvation is about deliverance from poverty. Salvation is not about deliverance from the wrath of God. Salvation is about deliverance from, from famine. And so the kingdom is not some eternal new heavens and new earth where we are in perfect union with the triune God. The kingdom is on this earth as we bring utopia here, inequality for all and the eradication of poverty and injustice. That's the social gospel. And it comes into full flower in the 19 zeros. And Walter Rauschenbusch was working out all of this in Hell's Kitchen, New York. And certainly in that era and in that moment, this was a time of a great social crisis and there were significant needs. But rather than apply the proper solution to the problem of the gospel, he provides the absolute wrong solution of a gospel entirely devoid of any theological content. But it's in the making in the 1850s to the 19 zeros as these issues of, of alcoholism. And, you know, this is a time when the water wasn't always trustworthy to drink. Uh, when there, there wasn't a, a plethora of soft drinks. Have you gone down the grocery store aisle lately? Uh, there's like three or four of them, I think, devoted to sodas and flavored waters. You didn't have that in the, in the 19th century. And so alcoholism was a serious problem in the 19th century. And, and in its wake, it caused all sorts of problems for, for wives at home and for the children at home uh, as victims of a significant uh, crisis of alcoholism. And so you have the temperance movements. So you have all these social activism movements, but sadly, they're going to eclipse the gospel. Uh, they're going to, to totally redefine and reconfigure the gospel. So, we have the re reaction to enthusiasm with a heightened rationalism. We have the social activism evolving to the social gospel. And thirdly, we've got Germany. Now, Billy Sunday would travel around in the 1910s and he, would, he knew how to whoop up an audience. We'll get to him in a little bit because he's such a colorful figure. So when we talk about the fundamentalists, we'll talk about the former professional baseball player turned evangelist, William Sunday. Billy Sunday, while he was a baseball player, held the record for the most stolen bases among National League players. I don't know if you can trust someone who steals bases, so I just <laughs> throw that out as an aside. Seems to me that's deceptive. But anyway, Billy Sunday would get right up on the edge of the platform. He'd always kick his one leg up. He'd put his hand up in the air and he was very dramatic. And sometimes he would even jump up onto the pulpit. He was quite an athlete. And he would say things like this, turn hell upside down. And you know what's printed on the bottom? Made in Germany. <laughs> now, it was in the throes of World War I, so there was a little bit of political maneuvering going on there. But that's not what Sunday was talking about. Do you know what he was talking about? He was talking about Julius Wellhausen. Now, Julius Wellhausen was a German biblical scholar who, 
gave us this idea of the authorship of the Pentateuch, the JEDP theory. And the JEDP theory is this, that the Pentateuch is not a single volume of five books written by one author, Moses. God's word handed to his prophet Moses, Moses recording every single word that God gave him, verbal, plenary, inspiration, and the end product, the first five books of the Bible. Wellhausen argued that the Pentateuch had four authorial strands coming from four authorial communities. One strand was the Yahwist, whose preferred name for God was the sacred name Yahweh. So that's the J strand. Another strand was the Eloist, whose preferred name for God was Elohim. And that, not necessarily a single author, think more like an authorial community, gives us that strand. The D is the Deuteronomist. And so that is a retelling of the law. And then the P is the priestly strand, not just Leviticus, but those priestly elements that are there part of the Pentateuch. Then much later, some scribe, maybe Ezra, pulled all those oral and written authorial strands together and called it the books of Moses. But it is not a product of Moses, but what's more, it's not a product of God. It is these religious communities or these sub-communities within the Israelite community, their reflections on God's interaction with man. In other words, the Bible is not a top-down book, it's a bottom-up book. And this threatens biblical authority. This is German higher criticism, starts in the 1810s, 20s, 30s, rolls on from the Pentateuch to the Gospels and kicks off the so-called quest for the historical Jesus. And that movement says there is the Jesus of history and there is the Jesus of faith. And so just as there were communities, there's a Matthean community and a Markan community and a Lucan community and a Johannine community. And in the 200s, 300s, 400s, they began to elaborate on the works of Jesus and the claims of Jesus. And so what biblical scholarship must do is sort of sort through, throw out uh, what they sort of like, they liken it to, you know, the husk around an ear of corn. The four gospels are the husk. And you got to pull away the husk, the detritus, let it fall to the floor to get to the kernel of truth that is nestled within the four gospels, the true teaching of the historical Jesus. It's called the quest for the historical Jesus. Germans all, these higher critics. And so Billy Sunday says, you know what's wrong with America and what's wrong with the American church? German higher criticism. Now, Sunday might not be right. Turn hell upside down and it might not say made in Germany. But Sunday's point, I think, is a fair one. What we're talking about here is importing German higher criticism. And it comes to America in two ways. It comes through books that American scholars are reading. And this was a very typical thing for an American scholar to do. Do your work in an American seminary and then go overseas to Germany for your PhD. And when they came back, they brought higher criticism with them. Fourthly is pietism, pietism. Now, anytime you put an ism on a word, right? Dr. Sproul taught us this, nine times out of 10, it's bad. Unless it's Puritanism, then it's good. Uh, piety is a good thing. Piety is a good thing. Pietism is a bad thing. What pietism ends up doing is reducing Christianity from beliefs to behaviors. So Christianity becomes not about my beliefs, but it becomes about my behaviors. It's not that I have put my faith in Jesus Christ, it's what I am doing. It's morality. It is what we sometimes call moralism. That's pietism. And it was on the rise ever since the Second Great Awakening. It's on the rise whenever you start talking about synergism. It's on the rise, honestly, it's on the rise anytime you begin to drift from Calvinism. 
because Calvinism keeps us squarely within that idea that there's nothing we can do to gain favor with God. And not only is pietism mistaken because it jettisons beliefs, but it's mistaken because it puts far too much burden upon us to be pious, apart from that union we have with Jesus Christ and apart from what Christ has done. So pietism is one. Fifthly, Charles Darwin. Darwin publishes his Origin of the Species in 1859. It takes a while. You know, America's always behind the European trends, right? It takes us a while. Paris has the fashion, takes us a couple years till we get it. Uh, so Darwin is 1859. It takes a while. And it's really not until the Scopes trial, 1925, where all this comes to a head. But over the 1860s, 70s, 80s, Darwin is making inroads. And now we have two competing visions of the origin of the world. We have Darwinism, which is natural forces at work, and we have Genesis 1 and 2, which is God created in the span of six days, all things, including the special creation of us, of man, of Adam and Eve, and so Darwinism. And then lastly, as we move into 1900, we see an increasing, almost inevitable view of progress, of world progress. Couple that with a view of essential human goodness, and we have really an unfounded optimism. So as we leave our, our past behind, and we look to the bright frontiers of what the 20th century will have to offer, it is pure optimism. It is the age of man coming into fruition. And this has two effects. Number one, progress means, by definition, newer is better. And why would we go back to the old ways? And we've already been told by the biblical scholars that the Pentateuch is not to be trusted. Biblical scholars who know far more than we do that the Pentateuch is not to be trusted, that the Gospels are not to be trusted. And we've been told by science that there's an alternative for the origin of all things from the biblical narrative. And we are in this vortex of the inevitability of progress what are we going to do with Scripture, and what are we going to do with biblical authority? We're going to set it aside. That's what modernity does. What liberalism has to do is negotiate that. Liberalism has to accommodate that. And so liberalism accommodates it by saying, it's okay, let's not take the Bible too seriously. It's okay, this isn't God's inerrant, infallible word to us. It's just another pilgrim's religious guide for us to have a religious guide. Don't throw out the Bible, just don't take it so seriously. And then what do we do with essential human goodness? Well, all of a sudden, do we really need a Christ who died on the cross as a substitute who paid the penalty for my sins? What if Jesus' death was nothing more than an example for us? Doesn't God want you to be selfless instead of selfish? And didn't Jesus do the selfless thing when he died on the cross? And didn't that put a smile on God's face? And wouldn't you like to put a smile on God's face? So go out, be inspired by Jesus' example, and go be selfless today. That's, my dear friends, what being a Christian is all about. See what we're doing? We are, oh, we're not just accommodating, we're giving it away. This is liberalism. We're giving away the essence of Christianity in order to have that cultural accommodation. Well, that was a lot of bad news, uh, this episode. So let's catch it next time for some good news and uh, see some confessional affirmation uh, to counter all of this cultural accommodation. So we'll catch that next time.